In this lecture, we'll be discussing the different math prerequisites for machine learning and data science, how these math prerequisites relate to machine learning and data science, and how they relate to each other. In particular, we'll answer a very common question I get, which is what order you should learn these math prerequisites in, and most importantly, why that is the order. To begin, the main math prerequisites for machine learning and data science are made up of three topics, calculus, linear algebra, and probability. Note that in most colleges and universities, calculus is split into three separate courses, typically called calculus one, calculus two, and calculus three. Linear algebra is sometimes split into two separate courses. Probability is a little different in that it's usually only one course. But depending on what field you're specializing in, the difficulty and depth of your probability course will vary. For example, you might take a probability and statistics course meant for liberal arts majors or as an introductory course in high school. This is very different from a probability course meant for science, engineering, and math majors. You can also learn a really advanced version of probability, which is usually meant for graduate students in statistics doing their PhD and master's degrees. For machine learning and data science, the most relevant form of probability is the one that science, engineering, and math majors are taught at the undergraduate level in a typical STEM bachelor's program. I also want to take this opportunity to point out that probability is not the same as statistics. These are in fact two separate courses. If you're only learning things at a very superficial level, they might be combined into a single course but you'll want more depth if you plan to apply these skills to machine learning and data science, which means most likely you'll want to take courses that focus on probability and statistics separately. In this lecture, we won't really consider statistics as a math prerequisite since statistics itself is data science. In other words, since statistics is actually just data science, it wouldn't be considered a prerequisite for data science. If you're doing statistics already, you're really doing data science. Okay, so now that you know about the main core courses that make up the math prerequisites, what order should you take these courses in? Firstly, calculus and linear algebra can be taken concurrently, that is, at the same time. This being the case, if you only have time to do one at a time, it shouldn't matter which order you do them in, calculus first or linear algebra first. Not a big deal either way. In my opinion, however, it is best to do calculus first because linear algebra is a bit more abstract and difficult to follow. In contrast, calculus is very mechanical in nature, so you don't have to think so abstractly. After that, you can take probability, which depends on both calculus and linear algebra. Additionally, although statistics isn't really a subject under consideration for this lecture, that should be taken after probability since it depends on concepts from probability. Now, I've been referring to calculus as one course, but as you know, it actually requires three separate courses. It's useful to think about what topics are actually taught in these courses, since that will guide the order in which you learn them. Calculus 1 covers differentiation, or how to find the derivative of a function. Note that this is for functions of single variables, so we'd have a function like f of x, where x is the single independent variable as opposed to a function like f of x and y, where f is a function of two variables, x and y. Calculus 2 covers integration, which is in a sense the opposite of differentiation. Again, this focuses on functions of single variables. Calculus 3 expands upon calculus 1 and 2 by introducing functions of several variables. It's also called multivariable calculus. As you know, we can refer to a collection of multiple variables as a vector, and so we also call this vector calculus. Now here's where things get tricky. Vectors and matrices fall into the realm of linear algebra. So sometimes this can be confusing for people. If they take calculus first, they might not be able to complete calculus three because that depends on knowledge of vectors and matrices, but they haven't yet learned about linear algebra. So does that mean you should take linear algebra first? I think the answer is no. The reason is because simple concepts involving vectors and matrices are usually taught in high school math. And this lecture is about college level math, so we're assuming 
you've already mastered high school math. Therefore, it's still safe to take calculus first. If this is not the case, here's how I tackle this issue in my courses. In my linear algebra course, the first section is a review of vectors and matrices. In my calculus course, I cover calculus 1, 2, and 3 all in one go. So what you could do if you are taking these courses concurrently is to do the first two parts of the calculus course and then stop. That covers both differentiation and integration for functions of a single variable. Then you could switch over to the linear algebra course and look at the first section only, which covers vectors and matrices. Then you could go back to the calculus course and finish the third part, which looks at doing calculus on functions of vectors, which, as you'll learn, requires you to work with matrices as well. Finally, after you've finished the calculus course, you can return to the linear algebra course and complete the rest. From here, you know what to do. Take probability, which depends on both calculus and linear algebra. But wait, there's a little wrinkle I didn't mention here, which is that probability depends on you knowing how to do calculus with vectors and matrices. But calculus 3 kind of only barely scratches the surface. You'll learn how to differentiate with respect to individual variables. So if we have a function f, that takes in two arguments, x and y. And let's say this function is x squared plus y squared. We'll learn how to differentiate this function with respect to x and with respect to y. But let's say we have a function that involves several variables, and it's a matrix expression. Suppose it's the vector x transposed times a matrix A times the vector x again. Now it's not so obvious how to differentiate this function. Additionally, we can even say this is a function of A instead of a function of x, and take the derivative with respect to A which is a matrix derivative, and these aren't covered in calculus 3. This is a problem because these functions are used all the time in probability and statistics. Traditionally, students are kind of just expected to infer how to do this. But since I noticed many students had issues with this, I decided to create a course devoted to exactly this problem, and I called it Matrix Calculus. You can think of it like calculus 4. From here you can take probability, statistics, and beyond. Okay, so now you know about all the math prerequisites and what order to learn them in. But how is this knowledge actually applied? Do you really need to know math in order to do machine learning and data science? The answer is normally yes, depending on how deep you want your understanding to be, what kind of job you want, and how effective you are at applying machine learning in the real world and even innovating in the field. It is possible to do machine learning purely with libraries like uh, scikit-learn while not understanding math. But even this gets tricky. For example, the inputs into any machine learning model are matrices of data, so you need to have some concept of what a matrix is. If you're using a machine learning algorithm like PCA, the inputs and outputs of this model are matrices. But understanding what PCA does, why it's useful, and what its limitations are requires a decent understanding of both linear algebra and probability. Trying to apply PCA without understanding these subjects would probably lead to silly mistakes. So let's suppose you really do want to understand machine learning algorithms in depth. Then how are these math prerequisites applied? Well, I can't list everything, but I'll give you some examples linear regression, which is the first model that both data scientists and machine learning engineers will learn about, requires all three of the math prerequisites we discussed. We use calculus and optimization to derive the so-called learning algorithm for this model. Well, really, it's matrix calculus because the objective function we want to optimize is a matrix expression and the answer is also a matrix expression. Furthermore, we also need probability because the objective function is a quantity known as the likelihood, which is a probabilistic quantity based on a probability distribution known as the Gaussian or normal distribution. You may recall that this is a function shaped like the famous bell curve. So that's just your first machine learning model, and it already depends on all three math prerequisites. But let's go a little deeper. That was a pun. I'm talking about deep neural networks. 
Deep neural networks are really just a series of matrix multiplications. That's linear algebra. The objective function to train a neural network is again based on the probabilistic quantity known as the likelihood. Training a neural network is tricky because the functional form of a neural network is very complicated and there are many terms. As such, it's helpful to break it down recursively. And this requires you to do calculus, specifically differentiation. This isn't hard because differentiation is complicated. It's hard because differentiating very complicated functions is very complicated. And a neural network happens to be a very complicated function. But once you manage to write down the differentiation rules for a neural network, you will start to notice patterns that allow you to simplify the process into an algorithm. This algorithm is known as backpropagation. Again, this requires you to have a pretty good handle on taking derivatives involving matrices and vectors. It's not enough to have watched a few videos on YouTube. You really just have to know how to do things on your own without assistance. Now you might object to this and say, well, thanks to libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch, it's no longer necessary to write back propagation rules by hand. This is true. With even more complicated architectures like convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and transformers, taking derivatives by hand is simply infeasible. Even I wouldn't want to try. Even coding up a generic backpropagation algorithm in Python would be a gargantuan task. These libraries do it for you and you don't have to think about it. That's great, but it still doesn't absolve you from knowing math. People often forget that. There's a difference between learning and practice. For example, in your first year computer science class, you'll implement things like strings, linked lists, binary trees, and so forth. Will you ever do this in the real world? Aren't there built-in objects for these things in essentially every programming language? And again, the answer is yes, this is totally true. So why is it then that the best programmers are the ones who actually know how to do that stuff? And the programmers that struggle to find a job are the ones who can't? So it's the same thing here. Backpropagation is like that first year exercise that makes you a stronger and more competent practitioner. But this doesn't imply that you're going to do this at your job every day unless you're so good at it that you are one of the few who actually do perform this function at their job. But even without backpropagation, there are still instances where you simply need to know math in order to understand neural networks. One example is with recurrent neural networks. In my experience, many students who are inexperienced with vectors and matrices don't understand the concept of number of hidden units, and they cannot visualize how they work easily. The equations simply don't make sense to them. This applies to newer architectures as well. For instance, take the latest transformer architecture responsible for state-of-the-art AI technologies like ChatGPT and GPT-4. These depend on something called the attention mechanism, which, guess what, is a formula involving matrices. So, unless you have a really solid understanding of how matrix multiplication works, you will not understand attention, and therefore not understand transformers, or chat GPT. Another math subject that pops up here is probability. Models like chat GPT and GPT-4 are called language models, where essentially they involve modeling the probability of the next word in a sequence, given the previous words in that sequence. Here are some more areas where probability appears. A lot of my students are interested in finance applications and stock trading. One of the great theories in finance, portfolio theory, for which a Nobel Prize was won, involves formulating an objective that will tell us the optimal weights for each asset in our portfolio. This again involves all three math prerequisites. The objective is actually the portfolio variance, and variance is a concept from probability. But as you can see, this expression is a matrix expression, so we need to understand linear algebra. Furthermore, since this is an optimization problem, we also need calculus, or specifically matrix calculus, since we're optimizing a matrix expression. In terms of stock trading, one promising approach that appeals to many students is reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, everything is a probability distribution, our goal is to train an intelligent agent, in this case, our trading bot, to perform optimal actions in some environment, in this case, the stock market. Both the agent and environment are modeled using probability. 
The environment is modeled as a Markov decision process, or MDP, which basically means we have some probability distribution that tells us the state of the environment in the future, given the state of the environment now. The agent also behaves probabilistically through a function known as the policy. The policy function takes in the state of the environment as an argument and outputs a probabilistic action to take in the environment. So again, probability appears everywhere in reinforcement learning. To conclude this lecture, I want to summarize what we've talked about. In this lecture, we introduced the three essential math prerequisites for machine learning and data science. These are calculus, linear algebra, and probability. I've also introduced a fourth step, matrix calculus, which depends on both calculus and linear algebra, but is a prerequisite to probability. As noted, calculus and linear algebra can be taken concurrently, but I normally recommend calculus first since it is easier.